We are here because Jetro Tool will release a new CD, Rock Flute, next April 21. And Ian, I read the promo from the CD written by you, and I pay attention to the part when you write that there are multitudes of gods and fulfill a need for many to identify with a favorite according to an individual personality or family traditions. But is this your personal case or do you think that is the case of the listeners? No, I, I make it quite clear in the detailed liner notes and booklet with the album that um, I personally have no, um, I have an academic interest in the polytheistic faiths of the world. Um, I don't, in a personal sense, uh, have any interest spiritually in what that means to me. I am, um, I am a simpler soul. I believe in the possibility, even the probability of one God. Um, but I don't follow any particular faith. I, I am. You could describe me in simple terms as um, being a, a more of a pantheist. I believe in in the spiritual essence of the Creator God as being something all around us. I don't believe in a. Um, I don't believe in the in the. Um, um, I do believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus of Nazareth, um, known as Jesus Christ, because he is the the Jewish prophet that became the figurehead of Christianity, and he, his is a great story. That's the success of Christianity. It tells a story. We all like a good story. And uh, it has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. And even at the end of, of, the, of the story of Christianity, there is the promise of a, a second series on Netflix. You know, the whole point about uh, Christianity is a second coming, another another thing to look forward to. And um, Advent in the Christian calendar is not only the advent of the, um, the, uh, the 24 days before Christmas, but it's also the advent of a new um, coming of... Uh, of Jesus and the 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 end of days scenario that is um, is uh, in Revelations. So, I you know I, I I go along with all of that in the in the ritual sense, and I'm a big supporter of Christianity. Every year, I do charity concerts to raise funds for cathedrals and churches because I I am a big supporter of Christianity, but it doesn't mean that I am a Christian. I don't um, um, I don't follow the ritual and the conviction of belief, of faith and of prayer. I don't do that. I don't have faith. I believe in possibilities and probabilities, whereas faith implies a belief in certainties, and I don't do certainties. <clears throat> Yes, and in your career, it's not the first time you are inspired in Nordic traditions. There are many, for example, Call Wings to Valhalla from Misra in the Gallery, released in 1975. Do you remember that song? Are there links between songs like that and the new songs in Rock Flute? Well, you know, there are, there are, there are always links because Rock Flute is uh, a series of 12 songs all written to a a certain um a certain for formula of having three stanzas of, his of historical and observational lyrics followed by two stanzas of those characters and roles of those gods but in a way that i relate to them in the present day so they all follow that same practice and and um I think you know that that that's something that sets this album aside from 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 any others. I mean, the the only time I recall anything about um, a reference to anything to do with Norse mythology is that one song that you mentioned. But I um, that that was a long time ago, whenever it was, somewhere back in nineteen seventy five or seventy six, I think. One of my favorite songs in this CD is "Wolf Unchained." Tell me, what inspired you for this song and the lyrics? 
Well, the the wolf is, is is the god, the Norse god Fenrir, who is unlike the other gods that I sing about, is is an animal, and um, and I I talk about the Fenrir, the the god, is based on the 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 the, the historical mythology connected with his behavior, his his role that he plays in in mythology. But then I take it into the present day when I talk about the dogs that 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 we have had in our house for the last uh, forty seven years, um, who are Grunendals and Tervurens. They're Belgian shepherd dogs, and um, they're not they're not so far away from their wild ancestors. I mean, they're benign and pleasant animals to have around, but protectors of the household. Um, they're a bit scary to other people because they're quite large and they sometimes show their teeth, but they're they're very gentle, really. And once once you've been introduced to them, they they're your best friend. Once they accept you as uh, um, as a part of the household, as a regular visitor, then they uh, they will always greet you in a very 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 friendly way. <clears throat> but you know nonetheless we have to remember dogs and cats they're, they're not so far away from their their wild ancestors and so i play with that idea uh, in that song but it's 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 fairly lighthearted in the way that i talk about it I refer to the postman's corpse to disembowel uh, i don't think our dog has ever disemboweled a postman yet but he barks at them when whenever there's a new postman and he doesn't recognize the postman he he makes a lot of noise but um i don't think he's actually bitten anybody so that's a bit of uh, fanciful songwriting it was bruce sore from pineapple thief who mixed the album why did you choose him well he mixed the surround sound album i sent him the stereo mixes for reference and uh, all the multi tracks and he He did the 5.1 surround and the uh, the Dolby Atmos 11.1 surround and the Sony equivalent Sony 360, and uh, because he had experience of working in um, Dolby Atmos and not many other people that I personally worked with before have uh, have done Dolby Atmos, um, and it's it's a bit of a learning curve if you haven't worked in in that degree of surround sound before, so. Um, Bruce was suggested to me by um, actually by another record company who um, had released one of his albums, I guess, and said, oh, you know, he, he he has a studio. And I think he did a pretty good job. I mean, he took my stereo mixes and made them a little more um, surround without going to extremes. You know, we're 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 making music after all. We're not we're not making a soundtrack for a blockbuster action movie. You know, we're making music, so you have to be a little more subtle. And in fact, in some cases, I said, Bruce, maybe you could be a little more adventurous with this this idea in this song. You know, don't don't feel that you have to keep things too much uh, control. Be a little bit more adventurous in terms of placement and movement. And and so, in a couple of songs, he does that. But uh, that, that's the story of Bruce. And um, nice guy um, doing, I believe he, in fact, well, I have a feeling we're actually playing on the same bill somewhere in this, during the course of this year. I think he's also on a some festival show that we're playing. Um, and I shall see him in a couple of weeks in London because we are going to the Dolby um, Laboratory in London in the, in the little theatre there to do a a fan Q and A and talk about the album and um and they will play the album to the fans and the uh, super high quality Dolby Atmos surround um environment of their of their own little theater. Last year was published a book Jetro Tool Lend Me Your Ears. How did you feel when you had the book printed in your hands? Well I I was surprised that I I was um I found a lot of it, you know, quite enjoyable to read. I, I was a little embarrassed about the idea of fans writing about their memories of Jethro Tull. And I thought if, if, if people have an interest in it, then it's okay. I won't say no, but I, I'm not the author of it. I'm merely um, involved. Um, I think I came up with the title of the book um, 
and suggested some of the contributors that might want to maybe would um, offer up something. But uh, it was interesting to read, and um, I was surprised that it wasn't too embarrassing as I expected it to be. So it, it was, um, you know, a book for the fans and by the fans. Yeah, now that there is a, the, the situation about the sex and the changes of sex are more uh, more common than some years ago, I would like to ask you about a song that is called Elegy from Storm Watch, because this song was written by David or D. Palmer, and you work with David when he was David, and with Dee, when she was Dee. Palmer, in the, the years that I knew him, I suppose from uh, end of 1968 onwards, I actually know the summer of 1968 onwards, I was a guy who was spoke with a deep voice and was very much a, a manly kind of a person mm -hmm. and um, had all the character of someone who was, um, you know, was a man's man. He'd been in the army. He'd been, uh, you know, had weapon training as a as a soldier, and um, and studied music, and um, he he was um, probably the very unlikely out of many people that I've known. I would say very unlikely to have decided to um, change sex, but that he did, and it was a great surprise to all of us. You know, we have to respect people's decisions, difficult decisions, I'm sure, for him, as it was. And, uh, you know, he is not merely transgender. David is a, a woman in the sense of great physical reconstruction. And he chose to do that quite late in life, which is very brave. You know, I could understand maybe if you were in your early 20s and you decided, you know, hey, I've been thinking about this for a few years now and I think I'm in the wrong body and you decided to go for reconstructive surgery and to to actually change sex i could understand that that you had the rest of your life to look forward to and to develop as a human being in a different um not just different gender but you know actually sexually different it's it's a very different thing when you decide to do that in your 60s and um so, you know, a big, big thing for David to become D was, um, I'm sure, a very big and quite traumatic thing to undertake. And I'm sure he gave it a great deal of thought and a great deal of of um, careful consideration and professional advice. Um, but now it's done. And too late, if you've, cha if you've changed your mind and think, I wish I hadn't done that, well, it's a bit late now. So... Um, um, I think uh, an, an example of a, a genuine full sex change. And, um, you know, it's, it's quite a few years now since we've all accepted Dee Palmer as, um, as a, an old lady who still likes to play music and um, devote her time to doing things um, uh, that still she is passionate about. Um, but it's difficult sometimes, you know, when my memories largely are about the David Palmer of old. So there have been times when I've been speaking to D. Palmer in the last months or years when I've I've actually said, oh, yeah, yeah, OK, Dave, how are you doing? I forget. I can, my memory goes and I call him Dave, you know, Dave Palmer. And um, but um, I'm sure I'm not the only person to to sometimes forget I have yeah. noticed that his voice has got a little deeper again in more recent times, which is kind of an odd one, because at one time he was speaking like this whenever I spoke to him. Now he speaks more like this again. So um, I don't know. Maybe the uh, the hormones are still rattling around inside um, her body. I don't know. Anyway, but no, we, we, we're we in touch from time to time and um, still waiting to, to, to do something he asked me to play on a recording. Um, which he has yet to do, I think, to to do the recording. But he's, you know, I said I would play some flute on something he was working on, um, and um, we'll see what happens uh, during the months to come. So I would like to ask you about Alamout, reedition from A, your album from 1980. Some people didn't understand the change, and I would like to ask you, how do you see this recording 
A after 40 years. Well, the album began at a time when after, at the end of the 1970s, when the guys in the band, um, I mean, there were two of them who were really unhappy. John Evans really wasn't enjoying what he was doing. And, you know, I felt that he was probably not going to continue. Barry Barlow was definitely not enjoying what he was doing and wanted to start something of his own, you know, recording and uh, producing and being a manager and doing things. And so it seemed like a good idea for every, everyone to take a break. And and I decided I would make a solo album. Um, and I did that with Dave Pegg, the bass player who had just joined Jethro Tull, but not played on any, any Jethro Tull albums at that point. So he and I got together with Eddie Jobson and Mark Cranny, a drummer that Eddie knew in America, to make a, a, an Ian Anderson solo album. While we were working on the album and beginning the first rehearsals, um, I felt that it would be good to have some guitar in it and so I asked Martin if he would come over and, and play on a couple of tracks. And to begin with, Martin said, no, well, this is supposed to be a solo album. It's probably better that I don't play on it. And I said, well, I think I really does need to have some guitar, but I would much rather you played it than for me to go out and find another guitar player. So Martin did come and, and play on one of the tracks. And, and then he kind of stayed and carried on because he enjoyed working with Eddie and Mark and you know, it was a good atmosphere in the studio, so he ended up being on all the tracks. But it wasn't originally intended for it to be that way. But then when the record company heard it, they they persuaded me that it should be released as a Jethro Tull album. They said, well, we can release it as an Ian Anson album, but it's probably not going to sell very well. And um, it will confuse people that Martin Barr and you are on it, but and Dave Pegg has been on tour with Jethro Tull, but... It'll be confusing. We think it should be a Jethro Tull album. And they persuaded me that that should be the case. And I wrote to the other guys to say, you know, to warn them that this was coming out as a Jethro Tull album to try and explain the background. But um, by that time, uh, David Palmer and Barry Barlow and John Evans had all, you know, begun to do other things. And um, so uh, the band didn't get back together again. Although, you know, I, I've played with Barry Barlow since and I have, and John Evans, we did ask to come and rejoin the band in about 1984, 85. But, um, you know, we had a serious chat about it and he didn't want to do it after considering the modern technology, which he wasn't very keen on. Um, just as Jeffrey Hammond, you know, we asked him to come and rejoin the band, but he wanted to continue his life outside being a musician and uh, carry on with his new life as a painter. You know, most of the guys who've been in Jethro Tull, I have continued to work with afterwards. And, um, you know, which is the way it should be, really. You don't just close the door and say goodbye forever. You know, you it's nice to, to have the opportunity to work together again. Perfect. Thank you for your time. Okay. I really appreciate this conversation. Hope to see you again. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.